We are continuing on with assignment one, making a fantasy landscape composite out of at least five separate sources. And those five separate sources or more should all be large components within the overall landscape. So we're avoiding what I call the sticker sheet phenomena. which is something from when I was a kid, you could get these sticker sheet backgrounds. I was gonna see if I could find an example of them. Let's say like this. Yeah, that's not a great example. But we would have kind of a, a sticker sheet background of like uh, the skyscrapers of New York. Here, I'll just put in skyscrapers of New York. And this matters. Okay, so you'd have a sticker sheet that looks something like this. And it would give you a big background. So that's the sticker sheet background. And then you would get a whole bunch of stickers of Spider-Man and Spider-Man villains. Right, so something like this. And then you would pull those stickers and then place them in the, the overall background. So you can have Spider-Man swinging from one of the towers and you can have Doc Ock on top of this building and you can have a big kablam going on between them. That is what we're trying to avoid with compositing. So what we don't wanna do is take some beautiful large background, like a wallpaper, fantasy landscape image, which many exist, right? And say, okay, this is my fantasy landscape. That's one of my elements. And then I'm gonna add like four different trees into it, like, a, like stickers on a sticker sheet, because then you're not really controlling the vision of your landscape. And though this, this artist, this is all digitally painted, but this artist did a good job doing what we're setting out to do with our concept landscapes, which is setting up a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, right? They have three layers of depth, very distinct. We have the challenge of having to find photo reference for the ideas we have, right? So instead of relying so heavily on one image that we then put small composites onto, we really wanna kind of puzzle our idea together from multiple sources. So if you go to the class and then you go to assignment sheets and you scroll down to assignment one, now that we're done with exercises, I don't give you a step-by-step -step in the assignment directions. I get you started with the assignment directions, but I will sometimes give you extra resources. So here we have from some past student uh, Maribel and Andrew, who both gave their permission. This is a combination of their final presentations of the semester, which talked about artists that each use photographic compositing to make fine art. The first is Eric Johansson. There's a link to a TED talk by him. If you have a chance, it's very, very interesting and inspiring like how he makes his work. Uh, he is sponsored by Adobe at times and so heavily uses Adobe products like Photoshop for his process. But just really quickly, his finished work looks like this. They are large raster images that could be done in Photopea as well as Photoshop, but they are unique concepts. So it's not like he could just take this photo. First, he had to think up the idea of these kind of uh, moon maintenance workers replacing the moon with a new one each night to show how bright it is, what color it is, you know, what shape it is. And they keep all of these moons in their, their moon van and then climb a ladder and hang it in the sky. So it all starts with a concept sketch. So before he photographs anything, before he finds any references, before he composites anything together digitally, he just has an idea of how to arrange the space. This is called a composition. And he's not, I'll, I'll just say it, he's not the most accomplished draftsman with drawing 
because he doesn't need to be. He knows that these are all going to be photographs. But what he is good at doing is carving up the space into the different focal points, foreground, middle ground, background. And then he does location scouting. He kind of makes props that will help with the compositing. He sometimes rents vans and photographs them. And then he puts them all together into his finished composites. And these are some of his finished works. He has a little video here showing that process. And then there's a lot of Photoshop of kind of massaging and refining elements that like we're going to be doing. The next artist that's pretty interesting, and here's a process video here. I'll actually just show the process video. Is Josh Jagraff. And he does just found images online, just like we are. But instead of doing five or more, he often does things like a hundred to a thousand different images composited. And every once in a while, he'll take his own photos too. So here, here's a portrait of Abraham Lincoln, all made out of uh, monuments and things from Washington, D.C. And so they're all kind of neatly cut out and placed. I'll skip ahead a little bit. So when he starts adding environmental kind of landscape components, a background sky, background mountains, middle ground desert, I don't know if the dog really works as a foot, but I'll let it go. Oh, there we go. We've got a better foot there, sunk into the middle ground. Now the dog's just in the foreground. And then let's see the ref refinement. He, he'll he add what are called texture fills to, to give a little atmosphere. Those will be kind of the ways we finish this off next class. And you get your finished composite. Right. That's a little bit more absurd than Eric Johansson's work, a little bit more illustrative, but using photo compositing just the same. And these artists are sometimes sponsored to create it, like maybe for an ad campaign, or sometimes it's just personal work. Like here, this is entirely made out of leaves and bark composited together. This is entirely made out of mountain shots. This is entirely made out of plastic bags. This is another one made out of monu uh, monuments and buildings from London. And this one's made from, from leaves again, like fall colors. And you can see his photographic process here to shoot his own reference. So that's just professional examples of how these techniques can be used found in assignments as inspiration. Okay, so what do we do once we have our sketch? First, I want to talk about how do you get your sketch into the computer because image acquisition, pixel acquisition is a big part of raster imaging. So we're all familiar with taking photos on our phone and then you can email them to yourself, get them onto a device. Sometimes I have Google Photos, I can just do it that way. If you're on a laptop like this, you might have an app like FaceTime that turns on your laptop camera, and then you can just hold up a sketch and then do a screen grab because we don't need our sketches to be high resolution. Small screen resolution ones are just fine. Now, something to be aware of when you do this I can turn off FaceTime now. I did my targeted screen grab. You can use print screen on a PC. Is that the images will come in as a mirror image. And so if you have to rotate your image or flip it from what your phone took, just find it in your computer, double click it, and it will open with a default program, whether it's Windows Media Viewer or whether on a Mac it's Preview. And then you just go to the options in preview its tools to rotate it. You know, get it the right way around. There are shortcuts for this too. And then also to flip it. So I'm going to flip this horizontally so that it matches what your sketch's intention is before you upload it. But it looks like this one's flipped correctly. And I, let me see if I can zoom in on yours, Logan. If you can read your writing, 
then it's the right orientation. Yep. So looks like we've got some some good examples here. Any questions from you about how to get your sketch into the computer? And you can use the chat as well. All right. So once we have our sketch, we go to Photo P, and I'm going to organize everything within my assignment folder. So here's my sketch that I, I did in an earlier video. And I'm just going to drag it right into Photo P. And my sketch has a lot around it. You know, I, I photographed or drew more than I need. So at this point, I need to choose, since I did two different sketch versions, which one am I more excited about? Let's see. I think I'm, I don't know. I think I'm more excited about a vertical one. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure my rulers are turned on in Photo P. To do that, you can go to View and Show. Underneath Show are rulers. And the shortcut for that will show on your computer. If it's a PC, it will be Control R. But on a Mac, it's Command R. And that will toggle your rulers on and off. These rulers are a pixel dimension not an inches dimension, but don't worry about that right now. The reason you want your rulers on is so that you can use your move tool, which is at the top of your tools, the arrow, and click on the ruler and drag down. And I want you to drag guides. These are called viewing guides. Around you, the sketch you want to use. It's not the same as cropping. This is first kind of getting us clean horizontals and verticals around our sketch, no matter how loose or wonky our rectangles might be. Then I'm going to use the crop tool, which is the fifth tool down. I'm going to make sure its setting says free instead of a fixed ratio. And then just like a transform box, I'm just going to drag those corners until it highlights the sketch I want to use and it will stick to the guides. And then I hit return. It's really important that you crop it, no matter what size your sketch is, because now we're gonna turn that sketch into the pixel space and pixel dimensions we need to print our full assignment, which is at least eight by 10 inches by at least 300 pixels per inch. So, I go to image, image size. But before I do this, while it's still small, it's a good time to save it. So I'm lucky. I'd already labeled it with a name, right? Last class. And so it's going to remember that name and it's always going to update to here. But now I don't need it to be a JPEG anymore. I need it to be a Photoshop document. So I'm going to go to File, Save More, and then Save PSD slash PSB. Leave it on the default PSD. Don't check any of these. It will show you how large it is. That is way too small right now. And it will show you the name it's going to be. When you click that, it's going to download. And when it does that, it downloads to wherever your computer downloads things from the internet. This is what I want you then to do. Move that file from wherever it downloaded onto your desktop or onto your assignment one folder, wherever you're organizing this. Um, I recommend you don't do it onto a USB drive yet because the USB drive connection is a lot slower than what it is directly to your desktop or to a folder on your device. And then in order to make working on this assignment work a little bit better. Oh, it's not done yet. So I should mark it as yellow. We're in process here. I'm going to close Photo P. And then reopen it. So this is about kind of the discipline of knowing where things are saved, especially when we're not able to work on our lab workstation.